Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, the May edition of the BFOUP webinar. We're very excited tonight to be uh, joined by the 2021 Maple Seed Pasture Award winners. Um, we'll be getting to them shortly. I uh, just have a few uh, small announcements from BFO and uh, bring a, attention to them uh, to our producers. So the first one, if you're interested in any past webinars that we've done, these are all available on uh, the BFO website that you can see them there. Um, they're also on our YouTube page. So feel free to go and look at ones that we've done in the past couple of years. There's lots of great information there from past producers who've come and joined us along with people from the industry. Um, information that you might be able to use on farm and just learn more about what producers are doing across the province. So really good uh, opportunity to go and take a look there. Um, you may have noticed uh, on our social media pages and in the bulletin board, uh, we currently are doing a Ontario Beef Swag Shop, just a pop-up shop over the past couple of weeks um, uh, that gives you the opportunity to go on and find some uh, Ontario Beef and BFO merchandise that you might be interested in. Tomorrow is the last day to do your shopping uh, just before the barbecue season and Father's Day. So if anybody's interested, uh, you can visit the BFO website to, to find information for that or feel free to send me an email or Jennifer at uh, the office um, and we'll be happy to provide you with more information for that. Um, again, this year, the Canadian Beef Industry Conference is being run virtually. Um, as well as a new date this year. They're having it later in the summer, um, more towards the end of August. So stay tuned for more details of that uh, for the virtual event. Um, there's lots of great information coming and you can also check out their website uh, for more information and details coming on that. Lastly, if you're looking for more information on what BFO is up to do, you can check out our website, uh, sign up for the weekly e-newsletter. Um, you could also be receiving uh, the magazine um, along with uh, signing up for social media. So um, I uh, really recommend you guys uh, jumping on board with that and uh, finding lots of information that way. So with that, uh, that's it for BFO information and I will put it on over to our guests for the evening. So I'm gonna change the presenter here to Jeff and Denise Byers, our Maple Sea Pasture Award winners. So, Moving it over to their screen and I'll put them back on video and unmute. So the floor is yours guys. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're so happy that you could uh, be able to take the time out and I'll, I'll let you guys take it away and, and tell us more about yourselves and what you guys do on your farm. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, it's, uh, this has been a, it's a little bit out of our um, comfort zone, a little bit out of our wheelhouse, but we've um, figured something out and hopefully uh, you guys might get something out of it at the end of the day. But um, so my name is Denise and this is my husband, Jeff Byers, and uh, together we own and operate Murray Hill Farm. Um, so earlier this year, Jeff and I were honored to receive the 2021 Maple Seed Pasture Award and presented by BFO, Maple Seed, and uh, the Ontario mm -hmm. Forage Council. So as this year's recipient, we were asked if we would share a little about ourselves, uh, about our farm and how we're using our pastures in our operation. So Deciding on a title today, uh, we thought about it a lot, um, and I settled for optimizing opportunity at Murray Hill, just because, um, as you'll learn, we're a very small farm by today's standards, and um, instead of striving for hundreds and hundreds more acres, uh, we chose to focus on what we do have, and um, made it a mission to get the most out of every acre that we do have. So um, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I really wondered at what, at first, like what our small fledgling operation could possibly bring to the table as, and, um, and it's our hope that if nothing else, uh, you might find something that you could relate to and, um, and perhaps leave like inspired to try something new. So, so Murray Hill is a new name for an old farm that's uh, been in the Byers family for five generations. Uh, previously known as Byersdale, this land in Blackstock 
uh, has seen it all from sheep to swine, cattle and crops. So now in its present day, uh, it consists of a 100 acre farm and we also rent 38 acres of adjoining land for pasture. So it's always been our dream to work from home and our vision to have our farm be the solution to that. So uh, at this point, we're developing a herd of purebred cattle that we market as breeding stock and uh, uniquely branded quality beef that we sell directly to the consumer via farm gate. <clears throat> so the picture of our little on-farm market that we've got set up in the garage. Um, so believing in the connection between producers and cut and consumers, we, we wanted to provide an opportunity for people to access truly farm fresh ingredients from the farm itself, like rather than going to the farmer's market or having it delivered or whatever. So we um so on the market we we grow all kinds of vegetables in our market garden. I should say maybe pie. Your market garden. <laughs> you don't have a whole lot to do with it. Um, and we sell eggs from our flock of hens. And um, and I want to just reiterate that the authenticity of it is is really what's important to us. And um, so the on-farm market allows us to answer questions and um, that our shoppers might have, and we're able to add value add value to the products that would otherwise go to waste. So, for instance, uh, you know, and when beans are ready you know we get we get so many we can actually pickle you know extra and sell them as as value-added products so uh set up part of our garage and are, we're only open a few days a week but that might change as the demand grows and you know with covid it's kind of turned you know thrown a curve and stuff and um so we've taken the market outside of the garage and online which was um which was huge and uh, again, we just we just keep learning new stuff. So, um, so we really feel that direct to consumer marketing is integral to increasing the profitability of our farm. And uh, cutting out the middleman ensures like traceability and freshness that the public is really looking for right now. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So our our biggest goal was to work from home um denise has written all this so i'm just kind of <laughs> going by the notes i haven't had a lot of time to even look at it yet. so anyway yeah it, our our goal is to to do as much from home as we can and make a living doing it um everyone would enjoy the sound of that obviously especially nowadays we do carpentry as well as another side business and it's been kind of tough to be able to uh get in and out of people's homes right now with COVID and things like that going on. So we're just pushing forward with the farm as much as we can and trying to expand it. And like Denise said, make the most of what we have. Um, truth is we're blessed with an opportunity to live and work with some of the greatest land. So why wouldn't we want, why would we want to leave it for nine hours a day and five days a week? So to talk about our operation, yeah, we'll just we'll just go through it. Yeah, we'll talk about our operation and we'll you know with so the I have starting two, point. Two screens here with no time. <laughs> um, okay. We're getting just... here. I grew up on the farm and uh, I left to pursue another career as a carpenter. And uh, there we go, where we came from. Okay. Yeah, I I left here to pursue another career and. Uh, I ended up in Deep River, which is uh, a small community between Petawawa and North Bay, kind of. Um, previous to that, I went to Campville College and pursued an agricultural degree, diploma. Um, so when I came home, ultimately everybody had different ideas and I, I'd gone off on my own and got married and became a carpenter and I was away and that's where I met Denise. Um, it was it was always a dream for me to want to come home, but in Deep River to come home and farm, you could, there was no there was no farming in Deep River. Period. So not, not unless you were farming. not unless you wanted to grow rocks and beach sands. So <laughs> anyway, the opportunity came up to move home. We built the we built a new house on a 
So right. On a piece of property, what belonged to my grandfather, and we previously dubbed it the ranch. It was a 50 acre parcel of land. Uh, we had always pastured it, it had always been pasture. After I left, it had been rented out to a, a neighbor. Um, my dad had, in the meantime, put paddocks into it and had a central watering system. Uh, it was divided into eight five acre paddocks with a center hub for the water. So yeah, was with it. the water was pumped from the pond by solar panel. Mm -hmm. And it did increase the productivity of the grass. The biggest issue with the central water system was sometimes the water would run over, you'd end up with a muddy mess. Anyways, where do you get them? We just decided that it wasn't ideal for what we wanted to do coming here to the home farm. So when we decided to set up a pasture here for our cattle, we uh, we oh, looked. Hang on a second. Oh. We'll just just hang on a second. Okay, I'm getting too far ahead. Or yeah, pretty well. But that's okay. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. So when we we actually built a house on, up here on the on the hill here, and that's um, his grandfather's name was Murray, and we started this farm would you know we want to call it and uh, that's why the name murray hill came into play so um and you know what with the cattle being literally in our backyards uh we you know you look out to them and and we ultimately i think we just all caught the cattle bug really if you want to call it that so um so yeah you kind of so i wanted to talk this is a slide here it's a little bit off in left field, but um, this a is a bit. little bit. This is a slide of Jeff, a uh, picture of Jeff um, feeding pigs at my cousin's place in England. So in 2012, we uh, we took a trip to visit my cousins in England who have a farm and they they raise pigs and all kinds of whatnot stuff. But it's um you know looking back, you you recognize those moments that are really pivotal to your thinking, and it um. It gave us a real different perspective and new ideas. And uh, so over there, of course, they raise everything on grass year round because they've got grass year round. But um, but it really introduced us to the concept of rotation and that fencing that was easily moved around um, and innovative wa watering ideas. Uh, they um, they it gave us kind of the opportunity to think outside the box. Uh, and they were actually a direct marketing product as well. So they were doing value added products. They were selling meat at the, you know, out of their garage and um, they were attending markets. And so the takeaway for us was that their farm wasn't huge, but there might be a way that we could use some of these ideas at the ranch. So we came home with, with that in mind. Um, <clears throat> the moment we chose cows, yeah. <laughs> Do we all have that moment or I don't know? Um, Not sure. We blame our youngest daughter. And um, so <laughs> she moved here with us when um, she started grade nine and she had never laid hands on a cow before. Uh, she decided that uh, she wanted to show a calf at the local fair that year. So uh, we were blessed, are blessed to have some really good cow guys and gals close by. And uh, we've got some great breeders right next door. There's uh, an awesome Charolais breeder not far down the road. And um, but between Bianca and Jeff, uh, we actually managed to get her a limousine calf to show at the Blackstock Fair that year. So uh, she uh, she actually went on to win the champion junior limousine show person at the Royal Winter Fair that year. So I uh, so now we needed a herd, right? <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> Naturally. Um, so, you know, that was for me, I just, I just, my little blurb here, I just wanted to illustrate the importance of people and farmers in your community and, and, um, and keep in mind how integral they are to the success of, of our farm and to everybody's farm out there. So, um, so I found this gem of a picture and, uh, for me, 
a few I, years ago. That's a few years ago, but boy, would it ever been cool to see it back then for me. I've never seen this. I, I remember the East Barn, um, but that's it. So uh, maybe some of you watching tonight actually might recognize oh. Byersdale as it was in its heyday. And um, I'll let Jeff talk a little bit about what the farm was and, and, and what you guys did back then with it. So yeah, when I when I grew up as a kid, we uh, we had about 350 acres to the home farm and two separate parcels. Um, we rented uh, quite a bit more land, probably another two to 250 acres. Um, my dad in the old bank barn raised we raised about 200 head of uh, pigs to uh, from from farrow to finish. We didn't farrow them, we bought them as piglets and then finished them. Um, we had in the home feed lot, between the home feed lot and the uh, east barn, we probably had close to 200 head of beef cattle here, finished steers to finish. Um, my grandfather actually, when he moved off the farm, decided he wasn't ready to give up the cattle business yet. So he backgrounded some steers and uh, Dad would buy them from him in the fall and he'd rent pasture land pretty much wherever he could find it to put the cattle on. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, we had about two, like I said, we had almost 200 head of beef cattle most of the time all at once between both barns. We would pasture some ourselves and um, yeah. Oh, it's a question. I said, was there anything your family did differently or any innovations I, that you can think of off the top of your head? I don't <laughs> know that we did anything really differently than anybody else was in <laughs> trying to make a living. <laughs> that was the bottom line. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, at, you know, bottom line, it's it's a it tough, was, tough it, act to follow. It was. It, it is. It was, and it is a tough act to follow. Um, in its heyday, I mean, it was a family farm, and that's how my parents made their living. And you could do it then, but it's not quite the same today to be able to strictly work at home on a farm. Mm -hmm. So this is Murray Hill Farm as we know it now. Um, as I mentioned before, it consists of a 100-acre home farm and a 38-acre rented adjoining field. Um, so, you know, our mission is similar to most farmers out there. We just want to create an enjoyable life for us and our family on the land that we're blessed with. Um, in order to do that, though, it has to be profitable and it's got to be sustainable. So uh, in our case, though, it means squeezing more dollars per acre while maintaining and improving that land for the future. Uh, so over the, you know, next few slides and we're going to talk on challenges that I'm sure many of us have in common. Uh, some opportunities, uh, ours of course, but um, you know that it's important to recognize your own opportunities and, and acknowledge them and how you can work with them. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of our goals moving forward and uh, of course that will likely change en route as life sort of does that to you. Dictates. Yep. <laughs> So um, again, I just hope that, that you find some of these concepts approachable. Uh, you know, we're not a big farm. We're not, we're not throwing millions and millions of dollars into this. It's, it's something that we're taking, you know, small steps at a time. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that anybody can really try and implement uh, in, in their own operation. So um, it is important though, like at the, you know, at the end of the day to try and make that, that, make a profit because if, if it's not profitable it's not sustainable and and you know it's not it's not a dirty word it's it's it, that's reality so um you know so we we just think outside the box sometimes doing things differently or or maybe even doing doing the same thing only doing it better um so it, you know it brings me to legacy and, and legacy can be different for everyone uh it doesn't always mean building a business that you can hand down to your kid. Uh, for us, legacy is in the land itself uh, to make it better for the future, wh whatever that might be. Um, legacy is about learning new things and uh, passing that knowledge on to others. Uh, legacy is about nurturing that love of farming that some of us are just born with and, and helping others make the farming life 
a reality, uh, no matter where that farm is. So, okay, so what about pasture management? Um, we're going to just go over some of the challenges that, that we run into that are often, you know, they're, a lot of them are going to be similar challenges to what other people are going to run into. Um, some of the opportunities and, and uh, some of the goals. So challenges, land costs and availability. I mean, that's a no-brainer for all of us. Um, it's harder to get, it's more expensive, it's uh, oftentimes unaffordable. Um, so, you know, depending on your situation, it's, uh, you know, that's sometimes not even an option. Um, the Pro proximity of the was, land. Proximity yeah. was big for us. We, were, we are trying to pursue uh, being able to sell purebred breeding stock across the province to fellow limousine breeders. Um, if we have somebody that's interested in coming to look at animals, we do not want to have to load everybody up in a vehicle and drive 45 minutes to a pasture or another farm or something like that. If we do have an opportunity to access more land, we would crop it and we would keep, ultimately we would keep the animals at home so we can keep an eye on them and have the opportunity to uh, show people the animals easy, more easily. Um, fencing is another one. Fencing, when I grew up, the whole farm was pretty well fenced around the perimeter. As I said, we pastured cattle here all summer on every little square bit of grass that was not croppable. After I, I moved away from the farm, dad, uh, dad kept cattle for a few years. Ultimately, he ended up getting rid of the livestock after uh, my cow. So all the fencing came down and he tried to maximize cropland as best he could. So when we returned, there was pretty well no fencing. So, so we had to start from that. square one and put a lot of them back up or whatever we needed for for to make make pastures up for cattle as we as we got more cattle at the time. So we ended up renting the 38 acre parcel next to us, which was previously in hay ground um so and i have a slide for that okay later. sorry but that's okay no. um so yeah fencing has always been an issue um, um we have a short growing season i mean yeah. that's an, again it's obvious uh but um so we do what we can um as far as growing grass so so that's a challenge uh but yeah having spoken to that um some land is different than others right i mean some some land just lends itself to growing more volume of grass. Um, so, you know, that's something to consider too, is, is your, the capability of, you, of the land that you have to, to grow. And for how, you know, how many bush or not bushels, bales, you're gonna get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, access to water, that's a biggie. Uh, you know, we're fortunate here that we've got pretty well a central system that I'll show you, you know, coming up that uh, we can pretty well bring water to just about anywhere on the farm. But um, obviously there's there's pastures out there that, that don't have water. So, you know, trying to find innovative ideas to bring water there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, because we are watering out of the well. We have two wells on the farm here. One supplies the house and one we use for the livestock. So we pipe all our water to the pasture for the cow. Mm -hmm. So um, on the end here, I've got age as a challenge. Uh, Age, it, it's a reality check. Um, we're not in our 20s anymore. I mean, I know Jeff kind of maybe looks like it, right. but, <laughs> um, you know, no, so, but I mean, it is, it is a reality. So for us to start a farm in our 40s, um, you know, can anyone say midlife crisis? Hmm. Maybe. Um, but, the, uh, you know, purchasing land is difficult for us, I mean, to finance. We're not uh, we're not going to take out a 30 year mortgage and still be paying when we're 75 years old. So, you know, for us, it, it that was a challenge and still is a challenge. So um, it just changes the way we we, you know, what our goals and, and how we proceed, really. So. Identifying opportunities now, I think this is super important and, and it's you know, it, it depends on everybody's personal 
situation. But uh, for us, um, you know, this is how we did it. We we identified what we had, and, and um, I think it was Jack Kyle that actually came to the farm to walk um, with us, and when we were just trying to plant out our pastures, and and that was the first thing he said was the layout of our farm is just is so beneficial because it's everything is central. So the the barns, the the buildings and our handling facility and everything is basically right in the center. Yep. And so it allows us to, um, well, water access. So we have yeah. two wells, like Jeff was saying. We can uh, we can pipe water pretty well anywhere we want. Um, so that that for us is a, a huge opportunity. Um, our soil composition, uh, we're blessed with really productive soil land, and uh, you know, we can that allows us to kind of maximize how many how many head or how many cows we can we can try and run here. Um, at the end of the day, our, I think our mm -hmm. ultimate goal is to have between 60 and 70 cows. We might be completely out to lunch and dreaming, but we'll need a little bit more. We're that, <laughs> we are in the process of looking for some more land to grow more hay and more uh, feed crops. So as we always, as, we as ever, always everybody be, is, everybody right? is. So yeah. So yeah, we were we've got some buildings, some infrastructure. Uh, the community again is an opportunity. I always see that as an opportunity, um, you know. And I think people have got to, you know, we're so grateful to have so much knowledge and experience around us. Uh, access to markets. Uh, we are like, what are we? Twenty minutes north of Oshawa? Not even. Yeah, twenty-five. You know, or like I mean. From from that perspective, we've got like for the market garden, we're so close to everybody. For the abattoir, we're literally like a five minute drive. Um, the sale barn isn't even that far. Um, you know, so access to those kinds of markets, I think is, you know, it really helps and makes things a lot easier and doable. Uh, genetic selection, I just put that in there quick, uh, just to sort of touch base on, on um, <clears throat> on science and technology today and and your ability to um to sort of gear your herd to to produce more of what you want and and for us we're just trying to we're, we're trying to raise breeding stock but at the same time we want a good marketable animal for beef so um not so everything we, will make breeding stock well that's right yeah. so we try and use use that that's a, a, just another tool that that we use in our operation so all right so our goals and missions we talked quickly about that before um but ideally you know we want to it has to be sustainable profitable uh we want to keep our costs down um but still maintaining herd health and gains uh this year i think we figured out we want one one cow calf pair per one and a half acres and we're going to try and get to one to one that's our goal so that might we might be at the lunch but we'll, we're, we're going to try we're working towards it um yeah we time off concrete is huge for us i don't uh, feel that the cows should be on concrete they should be as little as possible even in the winter time they're on a pack in the barn where they winter for the for the winter months and they are they have access to a uh, stubble field last year it was corn stalks this year we're hoping to uh, implement some uh, cover crop when they come in and we'll be able to utilize that for uh, hoping an extra month to a month and a half before we have to start feeding mm -hmm. so um, yeah at this point it, basically to produce as much pasture as, as we can mm -hmm and not have to buy stuff in i mean yeah. i mean it there may come a time when it, that is more financially suitable um but at this point we're just going to try and do it ourselves and and ultimately it's got to be a system that that's manageable for the two of us yeah. um it's yeah so so yeah so there's a just a quick overview of our system or our farm um 30 yeah. cow calf pairs um we've got 10 yearling peppers and we hold back about 10 bulls uh whether it be for breeding or for beef so the 38 acre pastures at the on the west side we've got a pond field um a drainage area which goes in behind the barn 
of a feedlot, which is kind of right central of the barn, fall winter field, um, which is out the front, and a cornfield out back. So we're kind of going to go through through these, but you know, I think it's important that that you identify all your different areas on your farm, and this is kind of what we've done here, and that allows you to assess each one for its pros and its cons and and what it brings to the system as a whole so yeah so this is probably the most exciting part so far for us so so jeff can speak to this one so yeah when we decided to turn this 38 acres out of basically productive farmland and turn it into pasture um i'm sure some people thought we were crazy but um at the end of the day we had to have somewhere to put cows so we did and we pursued it we uh we had attended uh like denise said previously we had jack kyle come and visit um he's a retired pasture specialist he uh basically came and went through it with us and he sat down at home after he visited and he kind of came up with a, a plan that he thought would work and so that was one route we took we attended a uh, pasture walk at brussels which is uh, tim Pryor's business he does uh, intensive pasturing over there and we went and visited one of their pasture walks saw how they were doing um grazing practices different with different methods they were using for water uh, they actually had a shade system there that they brought in from the states they had on display several different things that gave us some ideas uh, so we came home after that and it was quite different from what jack had recommended so i decided to uh, take another route and i called our local gallagher salesman here ryan nesbitt at cedardale farms and he came out and had a look at it and he gave us a completely different perspective again <laughs> So ultimately, at the end of the day, we kind of sat down and we basically took all three of those, kind of threw them in a bucket, put them together, made changes to everyone, and this is what we came up with. So down the center line, I don't know what color that line is, but where the water line comes out, is that what it is? So there's, a, there's actually a black line um underneath the blue line so the okay. black line represents the center fence line so, so this down, well the whole well the whole field is perimeter fence perimeter fence around the We've whole field that. down the center line from the blue post the two blue posts is just one single strand of wire um so the red lines are where the paddocks are divided and we run three speed reels and just step in posts uh the water line comes in from the right hand side and it runs underneath of the central that central line down the center we have uh, quick connects on garden hoses we have a 50 foot hose connected to a water bowl on a uh, it's just on a metal pipe frame that we skid with the uh, four wheeler every day with the ATV so we move the cattle every day so, um, here hang on a second paddock to paddock so here we go yeah. Yeah. So we open up basically open up one reel, and the cattle only took about a day to figure out that uh, when you rolled that up to the first step in post, they were going to greener pastures. So there was no chasing the cattle; they walked through every day on their own. Denise and I together, we can uh, we can basically move the cows in about 15 minutes, and it's all done. Yeah. But having said that. Um, and so, also, hang on a oh, sorry, so, that's all right. So, are you, yeah, just maybe talk about. Um, so, yeah, we open the one reel, the cattle move over. There's basically three reels. So, yeah. one, two, three that make up two paddocks. We bring the one over, or the cows over into the one. We take this reel down and we bring it over to the far one and set it up for the next bring day. Bring it ahead and it's set up for the next day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, like I said, it only takes about 15 minutes. Having said that, we usually spend about a half hour. It gives us the opportunity every day to uh, be able to see the cows, check the cows, and uh, yeah. So that's that's moving the uh, the water bowl. It's pretty pretty simple, and you can see there's a 50 foot hose on it. Um, so we try not to put it in the same spot in the paddock every time, so they don't 
make a mess. Don't make a mess of the pasture and we, yeah. try to. Uh, you eliminate yeah. that mud hole that yep. you end up like around that water bowl. So um, it gives us a chance to move it around. So uh, yeah, Jeff also built a sled for the mineral tub. Yeah, our, the mineral so, the mineral tub was a little uh, we, bit of a challenge at times last year. So we, we we have a sled this year going forward for the mineral tub and the salt as well. And we the, also do you have a picture of the creek feeder? I don't. Oh, but so we have a we have a creek feeder that we bought for the calves, and it's it's small enough that I can move it every day as well with the uh, four wheeler. So it's. Everything's done with the four wheeler. Once we uh, once we got the hang of it, like I said, it, it goes pretty quick and it's simple and it's effective for us. Oh. <laughs> That's it. Oh. <laughs> Jeff is seeing this for the first time, yeah. so he's a little. Yeah, I have not seen any of this until now. So. <laughs> so There's no pre-screening here. Yeah. Anyways, just um, you know, as last last steps, obviously we've got to check for power, and um, because we, there is, it's just the one strand of wire that holds, you know, that keeps everybody in. Um, and it's it's one fencer that runs the whole farm, so it's mm -hmm. we don't have a solar solar system out there for it. It's basically the perimeter of the farm. So. <laughs> yeah, and everybody can relate to the other picture because we we really didn't get enough rain yeah. last year, if you remember right. Apparently that was after morning coffee. <laughs> all right so yeah um 20 minutes that's it like I, he says 15 i say 20 whatever it doesn't matter um it, it's really all it takes uh, but plus however long i spend watching the cattle because you know who doesn't watch the cows after you've moved them but anyway um but but you know what that that brings up a good point and um that we interact with our cattle every day uh, we watch them walk, we watch them feed, we have a good look at the calves. Um, we can catch problems before they become a problem. Um, we can see if someone looks a little off or if the cow hasn't been nursed or or whatever. So um, I think that's that's super important um, to the health and and you know to, to the health of the herd. So yeah, here's an example right here. I forgot I'd written about this. So like just a quick Quick example, we had a, a yearling heifer uh, actually get stuck in the creek feed feeder uh, last summer. And yeah, it was a bit of an ordeal. It was it wasn't pretty. Um, she'd probably <clears throat> been there, I'm gonna, you know, speculate maybe 12 hours. Uh, we had a heck of a time getting her up. We had to cut her out because I, I don't even know if she got in there. But anyways, um, and you know, it all it all ended on a happy note. Uh, it took her a long, long time to recover, uh, but um, she actually never even lost her calf. She ended up she had a calf this year. Um, so on a day to day basis, she probably wouldn't have survived if we hadn't been there with exactly every day. Yeah. So it's yeah. Just a you know just another another benefit to being there every day. So. Um. Yeah, so benefits we've wit wit witnessed, uh, carrying capacity. Uh, we, we raised 25 cow-calf pairs on that pasture during the drought, you know, during the drought last summer. And I'm looking, so the picture on the left would have been earlier on. It, I'm gonna guess that was sort of middle of June, early July. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure, I know for a fact that the one on the right, that was done in September. So it just shows you the, um, you know, there's still, a considerable amount of forage out there and uh, it, I'm sure it never would have been there had we not been rotating those cattle out. Uh, the other benefit, uh, the cattle are forced to eat the tops of everything instead of being super selective. So they, it just, they, it makes for very uniform grazing. Um, nothing kind of gets big and takes over. Um, even manure distribution obviously um, kind of spreads that out a bit. But what, what the all the other point is is that there's no they don't get a chance to make tracks, um, so no, they, don't, know, they don't wear anything out per se. No. If you want to say it that way. Um, and we just noticed uh, like a huge like the the body condition of the of those cows they they really um, they really impressed us how they they came along all summer. Yeah. And um, of course the calf, the calf growth. growth was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had, um, you know, I think we did exceptionally well with with 700 and 800 plus weaning weights on those calves, and uh, so it was uh, really nice to have them in that kind of condition com coming into the the winter. So, 
Um, so just quickly, uh, just the other elements, we'll just talk quickly about the other elements of our system, our, our operation here. We've got a pond field. Yeah, the pond field's always been a bit of a sore just, spot with me. It's uh, it's very seasonal. That picture is very early on in the spring, so as you can tell, there is a lot of water. Um, there's At that point, there's probably only, like the slide says, maybe four to eight acres of usable land. As a kid growing up, we always pastured that field and never kept the cattle out of the pond. They always had access to the water. So over the years, it, it really got pushed in and became very shallow. So by the end of the summer season, the top end of the slide there where the pond field is written, that little, that top tip of the pond is really all that's left by August, September. and what's left for water may only be about the size of a dining room table but in the spring and through midsummer it's it makes it very tough to use use it and utilize it so going forward we're going to uh, try to uh, access some government funding maybe to uh, clean that field up and reconfigure it and put some fencing in to keep the cattle out of the out of the waterway and uh, utilize it in a better manner mm -hmm um yeah it's so yeah there's a that's probably a, a june or july day maybe the i think the cattle enjoy going for for a swim in the summertime maybe but um yeah that's that's probably well on its way to starting to dry up but it's as you can see that we still have let the cows have access to it because there's a there's really no way for them to get across from the barnyard where they have access to creek feed for the calves. And we do have a water bowl for them, so they don't have to drink out of the pond. But they we, all they know, want, we all know they'll drink out of the dirtiest puddle going before they drink out of a clean water trough. But mm -hmm. anyways, yeah, it's- uh, so That's just something to work on. Um, our runoff, gall I don't know what else to call it. Is the runoff gully that runs in behind the back of the barn and the house, and uh, it's obviously you know fed by the um, the pond in the spring. In the springtime, it it does flow through there. Probably early June to mid June, mm -hmm. it's completely dried up. Mm -hmm. It's there's no water there, so we do have part of it fenced off. We had uh, we had kept our show some of our show cattle in that that had access to the barnyard, so you could get them in and work with them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm um half of it is fenced half of it is not currently we're in the process of getting set up to get it fenced and be able to utilize it all and uh make better use of it because it really is not, isn't doing half of it's not doing anything right now so yeah. it's just it being long and narrow like that it is challenging to try and divide it up and um but it is it's you know it's a great example of, of just an opportunity to try and yeah. get more out of it okay next so yeah there's just a that's a picture of that area and um, part of it yeah yep. yeah and just start and it it area. does not have any uh cross fencing in it for rotation or trying not to not yet we just it's because it's such a long and narrow piece of uh grass whatever you want to call it land mm -hmm. it's it's really not suitable for Sorry. we haven't come up with a plan yet anyway but like we're not done <laughs> so um here's another there's just another part here there's a there's a lot going on in this slide uh a we're blessed with concrete um who doesn't love concrete on a farm um so i've got a, a little arrow pointing at a building there that is uh that's actually the cow barn and you can see north of it there's the feedlot and uh so it, it's very central and it um it's vir yeah it's virtually central to the whole farm and, and through it we can access basically every field and building which uh, gives us lots of options for moving cattle uh the field down below is um an eight acre field that uh the cattle have access all winter and um because the barn is open on the south it's just a it's just like a three-sided it's full yeah, shed completely open to the south so. and uh yeah so it gives them access to the 
to that eight acre field uh, all winter. So we calve in January, March, January, February, March, and uh, this late layout that allows us to bring the cows in as needed and uh, monitor the pairs closely while still allowing them outdoor access. So the last couple of years we've grown corn here to um, so the cattle could graze the corn stalks. Um, so the first the first year we had cows there we uh, combined the corn, um, left the stalks, the cows regrazed it, they did really well on it. Um, last year moving forward we uh, ended up with more cows, decided we were going to uh, grow some corn silage so we hadn't fed any silage previously so we grew that eight acres of corn for silage and we cut it for silage so it just left corn stubble so the cows really didn't get anything out of it um, so like I said previously moving forward this year we are gonna grow oats peas and barley in there in the spring it's in the process of being planted as we speak um, we will cut that and then either hope for regrowth or replant back into that growth in August and end up hopefully end up with a, a pretty intensive cover crop that we can move the cows and calves into in early to mid October and we're gonna we're going to uh, rotational graze it and hopefully we can get a month and a half out of it before we have to start feeding again. Last year we were on full feed on Thanksgiving weekend, so we were. Yeah, that was kind of hurt a little. <laughs> we're kind of trying to scramble and come up with better ideas mm -hmm. to make use of that field. So that's our plan moving forward this year. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. Anyway, yeah well, it just uh, you know, in in 2020 actually, we added 20 cows to our herd, which essentially tripled our numbers. Uh, so you know, it was it took some careful planning to make sure we had enough forage moving forward. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind, what was entirely cash crop land in 2019 is now all cow chow. So, <laughs> we have no crop income on the farm now. <laughs> uh, no. uh, so, we, um, we're actually going to try and do somewhat of a rotation that includes, you know, old hay ground and uh, corn ground and new hay. And uh, we're hope hoping that, you know, as the hay ground, um, as the hay fields deteriorate, you know, when they're three, four years old or whatever, we'll rotate the pastures into them and um, and replant, you know, the old pasture and 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 yeah, use them as so. So yeah, that's uh, that's basically what we're doing here. Uh, oh yeah, pasture improvement. So yeah, March seventeenth, found them date. Mm -hmm. We uh, had some fun mm -hmm. recalibrating the spreader after it was used for grass seed. Yep. <laughs> so and we we had a very small window for cross seeding this year. We very. were not sure if it was going to work. It was the first year we'd really intensively cross seeded. Um, about three days prior to that picture with the ATV, we had eight inches of snow in that field, and there was no way we were thinking we were going to be able to get in at the cross seed it and the snow completely disappeared in about two days so we did some scrambling and got some seed really quick and uh, we've been out to check the pasture this spring and we have seen some clover that has caught so we're very optimistic and hope that we are going to uh, get some benefit out of that yeah um, so here you can sort of see the before the before and after so yeah. there's definitely some room there to you know fill those those gaps in and uh, it looks like if um yeah if those seeds or seedlings survive all right it looks like we've had a pretty good catch um okay so you know winding down i just want to reiterate the importance of our organizations um you know beef farmers of ontario they have so much to offer uh, you know, it's it's really, I don't know, just a great idea to kind of just check them out and 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 look at all the different things that they they offer. Um, Ontario, Ontario, excuse me, Ontario Soil and Crop. Uh, again, like you know, a, a fantastic group of people. They're they're always putting on awesome workshops and and um, great information. Ontario Forage Council. Again, you know, 
I just think um, it's important, you know, your own fr fr uh, farming federation, whether it be OFA or Christian Farmers or whatever, um, your fencing suppliers, all these people are just so important to, you know, the the success of, of any outfit, really. Um, seed suppliers, local feed stores, uh, agricultural advocacy groups. Like we've got a Durham Farm Connections here that, that are just great people that um for connecting farmers to to the the general public or for or education purposes and um you know and and in general just the community your neighbors your your friends your you know whatever so um yeah i wanted to thank uh we want to thank bfo and beth for your tech support <laughs> trying to get all this sorted out dan ferguson for his encouragement um it's, uh, it was great to work with Scott from Maple Seed and, and Ray Robertson from uh, Ontario Forage Council on, on this project. And um, yeah, so, so that that's basically wraps things up for us. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to kind of be here and share this with you. Um, I guess the last slide we got here, I, I just found a couple of really cool quotes. Um, love of farming, uh, you know, when you find something that you love to do, uh, sometimes you just have to get creative to make it happen. Um, I hope uh, that we provided you with some inspiration for your operation. I, I hope that uh, we conveyed that pasture management and grazing concepts are like totally approachable. They're not, they don't have to be complicated and um, they can be implemented on, on a farm of any size. So anyway, yeah, thanks again. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. That was an awesome presentation with lots of great information. So thank you so much, Jeff and Denise. And already we've got some great questions to ask you. Um, so okay. I'm just going to go ahead and start asking you those questions. So um, first and foremost, uh, just to start from the beginning of your presentation and work from there, um, how did you advertise and get customers for your on-farm market? Like when you were first kicking off and starting there? Um, how did you get that information and, and draw those people in for that? Uh, you know what, the very, very first way we did it, I made flyers and I literally went door to door. <laughs> yeah. um, when we initially started, we started with a, uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the CSA program, the Community Sport of Agriculture box program, basically. That's how we did it when we started and we were delivering. So mm -hmm. I got to the point that I kind of didn't enjoy the delivering part of it. I didn't feel we were getting paid for our time. So when we came to the farm, we decided to uh, stop the delivery and force the people to come to the farm and see where their food comes from. And we lost about 75% of our clientele. <laughs> so it's been a slow process regaining, but Denise is pretty... Uh, pretty forceful with the internet and we, pushing it by that and it, you know what, social it, media it is there's been quite a bit of social media but um ultimately you know word of mouth has been good yeah. um and an email we have a an email following so we we have spent a lot of time and effort building a um a good email list and you know they we we forward we we put out the odd email and um you know maybe once or twice a week or once a week or once every two weeks and uh you know it, it just helps build connection with those customers and um keeps them coming back so mm -hmm. um and kind of to go along with that um when selling freezer beef uh do you price above above commodity retail to get that profitability mm. So we try and keep it in, it is going to be a bit more. It's, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to charge the same as what uh, Costco prices and that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's not, it's not outworldly, like, it, it, you know, or unaffordable. Um, we price it so that we feel that we can make a profit I and mean, we know how much it costs to raise those animals and uh and what we need to get out of it and uh, i think it's fair i think it's a fair price <clears throat> and um yeah so we we haven't heard anybody complain about the price so yet. far so good <laughs> that's good um another question coming in would 
love to know what one piece of advice you would have liked to know five years ago. It's you probably cost, don't want to know the answer to that. <laughs> it's going to cost <laughs> 10 times more than what you think it's going to cost. Yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. Um, building a cow herd, it takes time. Uh, to it, see does, what, it doesn't to, happen overnight. No, and to see, not. yeah, and to see the results of it and yeah. to see, you know, the, the cash flow come Profitability. Back. It uh, it doesn't happen overnight. So um, yeah, bank on on spending more money than what you think. Yeah, definitely. And and just to kind of go along with that, um, I was curious. You came back um, farming. Um, did were you working with your father at all? And was there any like decision making that you had to overcome a little bit? Because sometimes there's always that. Uh, kind of a little bit of difficulty I, I don't know if that's really the right word but sometimes the decision making can be tough because they want to do it a certain way and then you have new yeah. ideas that maybe might be a little different did you run into yeah. any kind of difficulties like that uh there was probably a little bit of it when i came home from college i was probably i would say a bit young and naive maybe and i wasn't 100 percent sure that i wanted to be on the farm um we did there probably was a bit of difficulty working together moving forward. Um, yeah, dad was that like, I mean, we both went to the same college. We both attended Kentville College um, and he was pretty much set in his ways, the way things were going, things were working. And, you know, it kind of goes back to the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I kind of felt like I was more of an employee, I guess, per se. So I just decided that I, I was going to try something different. So and now having come back though having come back um, yeah i think dad was ready i think yeah you know he was, was ready then but i mean mm -hmm. that was 25 years later so <laughs> yeah 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 it's, and yeah, now I you know what they're really not far we they no, they, they live on on a piece of a lot that was mm -hmm. taken off yeah the farm, they have, so. a, have a house at the corner and we see them every day and and uh you know it, it's 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 nice having them close by it's, I'm sure he would like to be more involved than he is, but it's, it's kind of tough. Mm -hmm. He's, we had beef steer, like feedlot cattle here. So he's really, we tried to leave one year to go to the Royal and we had a heifer that was expecting and we were going to leave him on calving duty and that didn't sit very well. So. Well, at least that's the impression. That was the impression we got because <laughs> he had never calved a cow in his life. So anyways. Yeah. It, it all worked out. She didn't calve until we got home, but yeah, he would very much like to be more involved. But it's it's kind of tough with the way and, and, thing. And it's a small farm. It's, it's small. small. There's, so there's it's, very little for anybody to do really at the end of the day. So he doesn't enjoy being out in the pasture field when we have a 2,400 pound bull out there either. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, a little different. Um, yeah. You also mentioned that you had Jack Kyle visit your farm. Um, was there anyone else and you went to Tim Pryor's too um, yep. and visited the Brussels and things like that was there anything else that you really felt helped out a lot when you were doing that um, that you really reached out to and felt had an impact making your decisions I don't know I they I, like I said I think when I talked about it previously I think they all had a equal impact it just we weren't certain that any given one of those ways of doing things was going to work for our setup i was i was very skeptical of jack's idea initially because he was pursuing a very intensive grazing and he had double the number of paddocks mm -hmm. and i just could not wrap your head around. wrap my head around having that many cows in such a small space so i just kind of like I said, we just kind of took a little bit of what everybody gave yeah, us and baby steps, right? But Ryan now... Ryan Nesbitt, he kind of told us not to take things so seriously and do things a little more simply. And so we kind of compromised, like between yeah. all of them. Now, now having said that, moving forward this year, we want to try and um, double the amount of paddocks. We are going to try. So we're going to try and actually make those paddocks even smaller yeah. and and go closer to 30 to 32 paddocks in that area to try and give um, those paddocks a little more time to recover. Anyway, we'll see how that works. 
Yeah. Dan Ferguson's the in fishy and wants me to ask who's the best uh, best one to ask, Tim Pryor, Jack Kyle, or or uh, Ryan Nesbitt. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> He's just trying to stir up. That's not too what? political. You know what? <laughs> Talk to all three because yeah. they all brought some Absolutely. some very valuable stuff to the you table. You can't. You can never get enough information. That's right. Well, no. That's and the thing is, me. I think what you, you did was good. Is, is you took advice and you kind of made it your own and applied it to your own operation and and did what was best for you at the time and and move forward from that. So I think. I think that's a good way of doing it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. If you have a goal of one-to-one -one pasture cow ratio, um, how much are you willing to invest in commercial fertilizer? Is a question we've had here. Oh, we will definitely invest the dollar amount. I to pick a dollar amount, I don't know. If we're gonna have to assess the assess yeah. the the, uh, the forage and the and the land and see what it you know what if we will we'll take some soil samples too. We did we did uh, fertilize it uh, twenty. It's been it's been a while. Well, it was two years ago. This should be the second year. Didn't get fertilized last year. Got fertilized the year before. Mm -hmm. um, we moving forward. We were pro we are probably going to mm -hmm. fertilize it again this year. If we feel we can get another year out of it. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to get another year out of it, and that may mean that we have to uh, put some grass seed into it as well this fall, maybe. Um, but like I said, we'll have to assess that later mm -hmm. on through the summer and see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question, just from your pictures, the pasture looks wide open. Um, what do you do for fly control um, and and shelter that sort of thing? Well, that's a good question. We do not have any shelter per se. Um, fly control, we our mineral licks have garlic in them, and that seemed to work pretty well last summer. So mm -hmm. we're hoping that it works again this year. Last summer was dry. I don't know if that means anything or not for fly control. Um, but yeah, we do feed the garlic in our mineral licks. Mm -hmm. So that's now the shelter. I mean, we were we were pretty apprehensive at first. Yeah. Uh, we were a little worried that we didn't have any shelter. Um, it is very windy here. If anybody's yeah. ever been here, they'll know. Uh, so there's lots of air movement, and uh, I think the key is those cattle have ready like they've got ready access to as much water as they could possibly want. So I think that. Uh, that kind of mitigates the the downfall of not having um, not having shelter. So for shade, um, I don't know. It hasn't did, it hasn't been a problem so far. We did see a, a, a shelter type of unit that's mobile when we visited Tim Pryor's pasture loft. But I mean, yeah. the price of it was a little astronomical for me. So. Um, I, Moving forward, it may be something that we look at. I have actually considered building something portable that we move, but it would also mean probably taking a tractor to the field every day instead of a four wheeler. So we're not, not we haven't counted it out, but we haven't had an issue with it. And I don't, last year it was pretty hot and dry, and I don't feel that it really affected the cows the way we thought it would. So they seem to weather it okay. And like me said, it's always pretty windy here and breezy. So it's, yeah. From that perspective, we didn't have a problem. Mm -hmm. We don't feel we did anyway. Well, that's good. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions at this time. And uh, we're, we've gone over our eight o'clock, which is good. That means we had lots of questions, so it's good. And you guys have done an excellent uh, job giving lots of uh, information and answering all sorts of questions here. So. Um, thank you guys very, very much for taking the time out and, and providing lots of this information and lots of uh, ideas uh, of what you guys do for your farm. I know I've certainly appreciated finding out more information and I'm sure our um, people who have joined us tonight uh, certainly have. So thank you once again for joining us and putting uh, your presentation together and uh, uh, certainly uh, more people I'm sure will be going on and, and taking a look at it. So. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time out and doing this for us. Certainly appreciate it. Our pleasure. Really. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Yep. All right. Thank you very much.
All right. What do you think? Okay. 